Welcome everyone to this online discussion hosted by CGT and Think Tank and the Macau University of Science and Technology. I'm Michael Wong here in Beijing. Well, this is part two of our discussion on traditional Chinese medicine, otherwise known as TCM. Now, TCM is a medical system that takes a more holistic approach to treating a patient rather than the reductionist approach of Western medicine. Now, TCM has a long history of over 2,000 years and since ancient times have been based on abundant clinical experience with careful and well-summarized records kept by physicians. And in the first part of our discussion, we spoke about the key role that TCM played in treating COVID-19 patients, as well as the continued challenges, but also progress of TCM integrating with Western medicine with both systems complementing each other. Now, since a lot of traditional Chinese medicine is based on herbal ingredients, today we're gonna to be discussing the quality assurance of herbal medicine and just get an overview of the safety and quality of traditional Chinese medicine treatments. And hopefully we're gonna dispel some misunderstandings along the way. And just a reminder to our online audience, you can participate by leaving a question or a comment on our Q&A board, or you can comment under our social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Weibo, or CGTN's homepage. We've got five fantastic panelists joining our conversation today. Each will be giving a five to 10 minute presentation. They are, Professor Zhou Hua, Associate Dean of the Faculty of Chinese Medicine at the Macau University of Science and Technology. We've got Professor Rudolf Bauer, head of the Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Graz in Austria. Edmund Lui, Associate Professor of the Department of Physiology and Pharmacology at the Schulich School of Medicine at Western University in London, Canada. Thomas Friedemann, CEO of Confi Med Pharmaceutical and head of key research at the Hansa Merkur Center for TCM at the University Medical Center at Hamburg Eppendor, and Han Chunbin, the Vincent V.C. Wu Endowed Associate Professor in Chinese Medicine at Hong Kong Baptist University. So welcome, gentlemen, to you all on our discussion on traditional Chinese medicine. Professor Zhou, how about we start with you and give us your initial thoughts and presentation on today's topic. Okay, thank you, Michael. So can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Michael, uh, and uh, thank you, uh, thanks uh, CGTN for giving us this uh, good opportunity for us to share the our understandings on quality and the safety control of uh, Chinese medicines. So, as you, as you all know, um, Chinese medicine, like any other medical systems, um, it requires safety, efficacy, and uh, quality. So, safety is the first requirement for Chinese medicine. There must be low harm to human, no toxic substances, and a low toxic effect. And efficacy is the fundamental requirement for a medicine, especially for Chinese medicine. The active ingredients contained by Chinese medicine can protect human from disease and treat disease by removing pathogen, regulating unbalanced regulatory networks of disease. As you may notice that both efficacy and safety are related to chemical compounds. So the quality control of Chinese medicine, the essence is to control is chemically clear and uh, consistent. During the 2000 years development history of Chinese medicine, our ancestors has developed many traditional ways to control the quality and the safety, such as by looking the good look and the good shape, and also some specific features of Chinese medicines. So let's look at the principle to control the quality and the safety. I would like to give you an example by analyzing the Chinese medicine foods, Ocolitum kamichali lateral root. The active ingredient in this herbal medicine is monoester diterpenoid alkaloid, the traditional quality control method is to do the microscopic identification, such as look at the size and the texture. However, nowadays we use more accurate instrumental analysis, such as HPLC DAD to assay the MD level. For the toxic substances, it's diester diterpenoid alkaloids, which can be removed by powder and water boring to reduce the toxicity is significantly. Traditionally, we can evaluate the safety by sensory inspection, such as by carefully tasting. And uh, also we can improve the 
safety by proper usage in combination with other Chinese medicine as formula. Uh, of course, now we majorly use instrumental determination to control the levels of DDA in this uh, herbal medicine. So the current quality control system of Chinese medicine uh, includes plant identification, morphological identification, microscopic identification, physical and chemical examination, and also marker comp compound quantification and DNA marker identifications. So the quality control standard of Chinese medicine has become more comprehensive than ever. Let's look at the most popular Chinese medicine genome. In the very beginning, in the edition of uh, 1963, Chinese pharmacopoeia, only morphological requi are required. However, when you look at 2015 edition, more and more quality requirements are included, uh, such as morphological, microscopic, TLC, moisture, total edge pesticide, residues, of course, the uh, marker compounds uh, uh, quantification are included. And the quality requirements covers more and more Chinese medicine in Chinese pharmacopoeia, as you can see, significant increase from the first edition to the current edition. And more and more national pharmacopoeia and, the rec uh, and the regional standards include herbal medicines and Chinese medicines such as Indian pharmacopoeia, US pharmacopoeia, Korean pharmacopoeia, British pharmacopoeia, European pharmacopoeia, Japanese pharmacopoeia, Thailand pharmacopoeia, and uh, of course, Chinese pharmacopoeia. The quality management uh, system of Chinese medicines in China are divided in four levels. The first and top level is Chinese pharmacopoeia. It is updated in each five years. It covers uh, commonly used Chinese medicine and uh, some patented Chinese medicines. So the next level is national standards and the provincial standards and the industry standards. So as you can see, a whole process quality management system from plant to raw materials and uh, to end products of Chinese medicine has been established and implemented in China. But uh, the quality control and the safety control systems are still under development to a higher level based on scientific research. So I would like to give some examples to show how scientific research can improve the Chinese medicine quality and safety. I would like to give food, foods as an example. This is uh, foods. It's a very beautiful uh, plant, but it's also a very famous poisonous plant. We use the lateral root of this plant as medicine, but the fresh root is very toxic. We cannot use it. We will uh, use pulse processing to reduce the toxicity, however, remain the efficacy. So this is a processed food that we use this one. It has potent effect and uh, po frequently used for cardiovascular diseases and rheumatizers stems. However, poisoning cases are still reported occasionally. So the poisoning cases are due to some major toxic constituents, such as acolytin, methacolytin, and hypercolytin. Traditionally, we use pulse processing to reduce the toxicity of foods. We usually soak the foods in mineral salt solution for days and boil in the machine in machine liquid solid. During this process, the toxic acolytin can be hydrolyzed to less toxic but still effective benzoyl During this process, the toxicity can be reduced to a very low level. We also tested the levels of toxic compounds and effective compounds in foods before and after the processing. We can see the toxic uh, compounds in before processing is very high. The level is very high. However, after processing, the level reduced significantly. However, the active components, uh, the benzoyl acolytin, uh, remains a high level. So uh, pulse is necessary to reduce the toxicity and remain the efficacies. 
However, during our research, we also found that uh, two important toxic uh, uh, compounds, hypercolitin, hypercolitin and uh, methacolitin are still remain high level and uh, therefore should be controlled. We published this research in 2005. Then in Chinese pharmacopoeia, it upgraded the safety control standard for foods because in 2005 edition, it only requires a uh, control quantity level. However, in 2010 edition, it asked to control all six alkaloids. So we also found some heightened toxic compounds in foods because poison cases related to unicolitin and crassicolin A, which are two new type uh, alkaloids in foods has been reported in Hong Kong. So we tested the marketed uh, foods sample and found the existence of unicolitin and crassicolin A in foods because unicolitin and crassicolin A are toxic DTA type alkaloid and have similar chemical structure and toxicity as alcolitin. However, they are more difficult than alcolitin to be hydrolyzed for lowering down toxicity during pulse processing. So we think uh, this is very important. So we published a paper again in 2017 and uh, then we proposed two new standards uh, at ISO, which is International Organization for Standardization under TC24 line, the technical committee responsible for the development of international standard in the field of traditional Chinese medicine. So these two standards include determination of selected alcoholitum alkaloids by HPLC and the processed alcoholitum chemically lateral route. So this standard can implement the new methods and the quality markers uh, for foods and can guarantee the quality and safe use of foods in an international context. So the, the chemical composition is very important to control the quality and the safety. However, for Chinese medicine, proper usage of Chinese medicine is also very critical to ensure the safety. According to Chinese medicine theories, and also in the practice, Chinese medical doctors always prescribe patients with mixture of Chinese medicine. The components of Chinese medicine in a TCM formula can enhance the efficacy to each other and at the same time to reduce the toxicity of toxic herbs. We can call it a synergistic effect. So I want to give one more example we have done before. Foods is a commonly prescribed uh, medicine with peony for synergistic effect since the Eastern Han Dynasty by ancient doctor Zhang Zhongjin. So uh, we have done some research. We select the major composition of these two herbs, which is purifying and alcoholitin, as an example to study their interaction. So we give purifying and uh, alcoholitin to mice simultaneously, and then we test the blood level. We found that purifying significantly reduced the oral absorption of alcoholitin, and we also found that purifying reduced acute toxicity of alcoholitin, showing by the reduced, significantly reduced mice death rate after their combination use. So we can conclude that peony can reduce the toxicity of foods in a formula. That's why Chinese medicine use uh, several herbs to gather, together to produce synergistic effect. So in conclusion, we can say that China has enforced comprehensive quality control system for Chinese medicine to guarantee the safety and efficacy of Chinese medicine. The safe use of Chinese medicine relies on both sound quality control systems and the proper usage of Chinese medicine, in line with the theories and the practice of TCM. However, we need to bear this in your mind, basic research is still needed to discover new quality markers and develop new methods for enhancing quality control system of Chinese medicine. That's what I want to share with you. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Zhou, for your thoughts on this. You mentioned safety, quality, and efficacy as sort of the three pillars of traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, and that the quality standard of Chinese medicine has right now become more comprehensive than ever, but also 
more scientific research is needed to improve the quality of TCM. So thank you so much for that. Uh, Professor Bauer, over to you now. So, uh, hello everybody and uh, thank you very much, Michael, for the introduction. I uh, now continue to uh, discuss the issue of quality and safety from a European perspective. Although, of course, uh, we are thinking globally nowadays, and I think the, the Asian or Chinese perspective is not so much different from uh, the European perspective. Nevertheless, we have some maybe a little different regulations also in Europe. And if you are discussing globalization of Chinese medicine and the global use, of course, we have to consider also the, the different situations uh, all over the world. Now, uh, I was asked to uh, address uh, three questions. Are there any risks to take herbal medicine in general and how to evaluate the quality and to ensure the safety? And finally, how can we improve the safety of TCM products? And uh, these questions, I think, are really essential uh, for uh, uh, global use because everywhere people are concerned about these issues. And as Professor Boa already mentioned, uh, the three aspects of efficacy, safety, and quality are the, the major uh, focus uh, which we have to address in the, in the safe and evidence-based use. Uh, and uh, when we discuss quality, we have to realize that quality is the basis of efficacy and safety. Because if the quality is changing, then also efficacy is changing and even also safety will change. So we have really to guarantee quality in order to have a reliable uh, effect of Chinese medicine. And if we uh, think about the, the definition of quality, it may be also interesting to see that uh, it's not really uh, addressing any content of constituents or so, but the definition of quality by the European regulation is just a very simple one, saying that quality is the suitability for the intended use. So I think that is uh, very important which means also that we have to address quality in a very broad and, and holistic way. Now, are there any risks to take herbal medicine or, or what are the risks? From our perspective, uh, there are several uh, points we have to address. And uh, one is that uh, the material may be adulterated or misidentified. There have been several cases in the past, like uh, Aristolochic, uh, Aristolochia uh, plants, for example. Then we have the issue of contaminants. The material may be contaminated by pesticides, by heavy metals, also by microbes. So we have to test uh, these aspects as well. Um, especially microbial contamination by some fungi, by some molds, may also uh, cause some toxins and some toxicity. Uh, then, of course, uh, as Professor Wai already uh, has mentioned, we have also some herbs which contain toxic constituents, and therefore we have to uh, guarantee that the content of these toxic constituents is not too high, or even that the material is void of the toxic constituents. And this may be achieved by uh, processing, by poucher, and so we have also to control that the processing has been performed in an adequate and, and a perfect way. So a lot of quality control finally is needed. So how to guarantee or to ensure the quality, I think is a simple answer. We have to test, 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 test. I think a lot of testing is needed uh, in order to really guarantee uh, this quality and finally the safety. It has already been mentioned that the quality tests are based on the pharmacopoeias, and we have, of course, the Chinese pharmacopoeia as a, a major input, uh, which contains uh, more than 600 Chinese herbs. But uh, in principle, the pharmacopoeias in the different continents do not uh, differ so much. We have all very similar aspects to uh, analyze. And first is a, a test for identity. 
We have to be sure that it is the correct material. We have to test the purity, which means adulterations, as I have mentioned. We have to test, uh, according to the pharmacopoeia, uh, several foreign materials like the heavy metals, pesticides, microtoxins, even fumigation agents uh, are relevant. And then we have also special tests in the pharmacopoeias for microbial contamination. Uh, and uh, we all know that some microbes like salmonella or so are, are also very risky. And therefore the material has of course to be void of such uh, toxic or dangerous microbes. If you're talking about uh, finished products and extracts, of course, we have also to test whether any residual solvents, any organic solvents may be left in the material. And this can be easily done also by some uh, chromatographic analysis. And finally, we have the assay. And um, the assay should be addressing uh, as far as possible the active markers, so compounds which are relevant for the activity but we have also to admit that in many cases, we don't know the therapeutically relevant compounds. So we have to also use pharmaceutical markers for this purpose. Now, uh, the situation in Europe is that uh, since uh, almost 15 years now, we are elaborating uh, monographs also for Chinese herbs for the European pharmacopoeia. I'm currently the chairman of the working group for Chinese herbs. And so far, we have already implemented 73 monographs of Chinese herbs in the European pharmacopoeia, which means we have already done a lot of work and uh, people or pharmacists in Europe can rely on these uh, monographs of the European pharmacopoeia. And uh, this work is still going on. We have uh, some more monographs uh, to be elaborated and uh, so this process will be continued in the future. It can be monitored also from outside. Uh, every draft of a monograph is published in an online journal, Pharma Europa, which is open access, and you can really uh, check the drafts. Um, and um, including also in the, included in the European Pharmacopoeia, we have also some general methods we have uh, tests for uh, allosteolochic acid, for example. And so uh, these are all um, tests and monographs which are really um, focused on Chinese medicine in the European pharmacopoeia. Now, uh, just to mention few aspects and tests which are obligatory according to European, uh, uh, to European pharmacopoeia. We have some uh, metal reagent residues to be tested. We have the heavy metals, as I have mentioned. We have a special monograph for microbial uh, contamination and, and examination. We have uh, this uh, monograph or test for pesticide residues for aflatoxin B1, for anastolochic acid, which is a toxic constituent of some uh, Chinese herbs. We have also a test for another uh, a fungal toxin, or ochratoxin in herbal drugs. And um, we have or will have a special test for pyrolysin alkaloids in herbal drugs. Uh, these compounds are also liver toxic compounds which occur in, in some herbs. And it's also necessary to have a test on these compounds. Just to give you um, some examples, the pyrolysin alkaloids, which are these uh, liver toxic constituents of uh, some plants, they um, are really quite uh, risky and dangerous. And according to European regulation, the consumption should not be more than one microgram uh, per day, which means uh, we have to know and have to determine the content of these pyrolysin alkaloids in order to guarantee a safe use of these herbs. And here you see also some examples of plants which are used in Chinese medicine, which are known to contain uh, also some or a lot of such uh, pyrolysin alkaloids like uh, Jie Tu Wu or Qian Li Guang, uh, Zizao or Dian Zizao. So for these herbs, it should really be obligatory to test for pyrolysin alkaloids. And uh, we have already done some analysis also on Guangdong Hua on farfarefloes, and you see here that uh, we found 1.6 milligram uh, 
of pyrolysin alkaloids in uh, per kilogram, which is not very much, but still it's too much uh, because at the end, it would allow only to use 0.2 gram of these flowers per day. And of course, regularly much more is used, which means uh, we need really to control the content of these prolistin alkaloids in order to uh, guarantee a safe use. For the uh, mycotoxins, we have some special regulations for aflatoxin B1 in the European Pharmacopeia. And it's also only two ppm, two parts per million, which are allowed uh, as a maximum. And uh, we have also some regulation for ochratoxin, uh, which is even more toxic and, uh, but more complicated to uh, determine. Five nanogram per kilogram body weight is the current limit. And uh, according to some investigations uh, by a lab by Dr. Gasser in Germany, uh, he found that there are some Chinese herbs we are, who were, which were really quite high in, in aflatoxin. And you see, for example, Yuli Ren or Baizi Ren, uh, they contain quite a high content of aflatoxin B1. And for that reason, these batches, which are uh, contaminated obviously by this Aspergillus flavus, uh, yellow uh, mold, uh, these batches should not be used. Now, uh, coming to the more general aspect and also on the, to the positive side, on the active constituents, uh, so far, I think uh, most of the monographs in the pharmacopoeias are relying on single marker compounds or maybe sometimes two. But uh, on the other side, from a scientific perspective, we have to realize that uh, the activity of a herbal medicine is never the effect of a single compound. And I regularly compare it with an orchestra. Of course, you play, can play music with a single instrument, but herbal medicine and Chinese medicine in particular is using fufang, which means a combination of several herbs. And it's like an orchestra. And therefore, we should not only look on one instrument, uh, but we look more on the holistic uh, view, have a more holistic view, and uh, therefore, I think for the future, we need a more a holistic approach for the quality control of Chinese medicine. To show you one example, uh, there is uh, Angelica Silensis, which is Dangui. And uh, currently in the pharmacopoeia, we have an essay which is focused on ferulic acid. It's this little peak and compound in Dangui. And uh, the overall quality is now relying on the content of this little peak. The question is whether this is, is reasonable. And therefore, I think uh, in the future, we should really also look on to the other compounds which are also contributing to the activity. And the, um, the um, solution will be a metabolomics-based approach, which means that we have to really do a very comprehensive analysis by uh, LCMS, and we should really uh, identify as many compounds as possible, and finally do a really uh, metabolomics-based quality control. And so I think this is the future. It will take some more years probably to elaborate all these uh, standards, but uh, for the future, I think uh, this is uh, really the way to go. Another way to go is um, to, uh, provide material from controlled cultivation because uh, cultivation really guarantees that uh, the quality of the material can be produced in a sustainable and controlled way. We can guarantee easily a correct species. We can guarantee that there is no contamination or less contamination at least. We can control harvesting time and therefore the, the content of the constituents and we have at the end uh, less variation in quality. And of course, for a uh, uh, global and uh, high level supply, it will also be a challenge to have a sustainable supply, which means uh, we have to guarantee in the future that uh, material is not uh, just harvested from the wild and plants get endangered, but we should really provide sustainable material cultivated uh, in the fields. So to summarize, I think the quality is really the basis for efficacy and safety, and especially also for the safety of the material. 
quality is never an accident, but it should be a strategy. Um, we need proper tests to uh, look for the identity and purity of the material. And these tests are usually provided by the pharmacopoeia monographs. And uh, finally, as I have mentioned, controlled cultivation is uh, the way to go, which finally is using also good agricultural practice. But GMP, of course, is also important for the production of finished products, also for doing processing like uh, pouche. These should all be done under controlled conditions. And finally, I also think that for the future, we need uh, even more research also to uh, go for that holistic project. We should really identify all the therapeutically relevant compounds so that the quality control can be really based on these compounds. And uh, therefore, the, the whole TCM will be uh, more evidence-based in the future. Thank you very much. Shishi. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Bauer, for your remarks talking about the quality and safety of TCM from a European perspective. You also touched upon some of the risks to herbal medicine and offering some solutions in terms of how we can minimize some of these risks. Thank you for that. Uh, Professor Louis, over to you now. Okay. See if I can share my screen. Uh, oh. Is that okay? With the screen? It should pop up. Yeah. Okay, there we go. good. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael, for the uh, organizing this discussion panel. I was an uh, honor to join this uh, uh, exciting group of speakers. Uh, what I'd like to do today is to talk about some of the Canadian perspective uh, regarding quality and safety of TCM. And I uh, will start with, let me see, Let's see, I can, oh, how come my screen is frozen? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so I'd like to give you some background about the regulatory framework in Canada and then discuss some of the regulatory issue using American ginseng as a case study, highlighting some of the challenges and hopefully to, to stimulate a discussion to identify some of the <clears throat> uh, solutions to these challenge. So first of all, <clears throat> TCM is regulated uh, under the natural health product regulations that is administered by the Natural and Non-Prescription Health Product Directorate of Health Canada. So it is grouped together with other plant-based uh, medicines, um, probiotics, vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and products like that. And... Uh, <clears throat> So there are right now, there are about 43,000 products being registered. About a thousand of them belong to the ginseng category. This number may be a little bit overestimated because uh, many manufacturers may get registration, uh, several registrations for a single product. Just wanted to let you know that. Now, the Regulation regarding uh, herbal medicine is only restricted to finished product, whereas raw herbs are usually treated as food. <clears throat> Another important aspect is this regulation do not apply to compounding products by healthcare practitioner. That would suggest that the uh, medicine that are prescribed by a TCM practitioner in Canada would not be regulated per se uh, with reference to quality, safety, and efficacy. <clears throat> now, the Canadian regulation came into effect a while back in 2004, 
uh, is quite different from the U.S. because in Canada you do require a pre-market assessment. I mean, you need to provide us for a license for the product and also for the manufacturer a site license to perform good manufacturing practice pr to produce the product. Uh, now there is some movement in terms of the approach used in Canada. We are now using what we call a risk-based approach. So the evidence to support the registration or licensing of a product will depending on the risk it poses to the consumer. So with those low risk products, the, reg the registration of the licensing it's much easier. And there are basically two types of uh, products, depend of herbal product, depending on the health claim. So the first one is traditional health claim versus modern health claim. So TCM would obviously follow or could, be, could follow, could fall into the traditional medicine health claim. So in the Health Canada actually have look at some of these uh, well established traditional products and prepare monograph as described by Professor Bauer in Europe. These are basically allow, uh, uh, allow pre-approval for the use of this material. For example, a, for North American ginseng in the monograph, it stated that it could be used in herbal medicines as an adaptogen to help maintain a healthy immune system or to support, uh, promote good healthy glucose level. Now, you can also uh, register under the health claim under TCM's approach, for example, use in TCM for the deficiency of qi and yin, internal heat, cough, uh, fire in the deficiency syndrome, dysphoria, and dry mouth and thirst. So in a way, the Canadian government are quite open-minded to the traditional medicine, do respect cultural differences, so that's a good thing. Now, going back to the other uh, approach relating to the modern health claims, so they are, depending on the risk level, you may have the lower level, something that modify function, including various risk factor for health promotion. Then the next level is to correct or restore specific organic function. And then the highest level is therapeutic for the prevention or treatment of diseases. Okay, so uh, so this is for the uh, registration. Now to move on to the quality and safety issue and the criteria that are required by Health Canada for the registration of these products. So these are very similar to uh, what. Uh, the earlier speaker I've talked about, uh, so I don't really need to go into great detail. So obviously purity is, is important. Make sure that it is not adulterated by other unwanted herbs or chemical. And you have to control the contaminant in terms of microbes, pesticides, heavy metals, mycotoxin. Uh, I think to me is a lot of time people forgotten about the importance of the control of the quality and safety is the is not how good it is, but how consistent the the quality and safety uh, feature of the product is. So, unfortunately, in Canada, there's very few standardized products out there. So it do pose some issue to the safety and efficacy for some of, to the consumer. Now, now move on to some of the quality assessment issue 
that relate to ginseng. What I'm trying to do is try to talk about it uh, for the scientific perspective, but also link to the the practice in the field. For example, uh, how do you assess quality in the in commerce when you're looking at the raw herb at a farm gate? So what do you look at? Age, size, shape, and taste. So usually by October every year, buyer from China, Hong Kong will come to the visit the various farm. And this is what they're looking at. And uh, this is how millions of dollars may change hands based on this criteria. Okay, so no analysis is needed. Now, whereas for the first finished product that is administered by the uh, Directorate of Health Canada, they do, as I said, more scientifically based approach in the, anal in, in the regulation. Uh, but in general, no specific marker are being asked for. In general, there was uh, uh, some manufacturer, they use a total ginsenoside that are based on the six or seven major ginsenoside that are present in the product to guarantee, I guess, quality. Now, some better, some manufacturer go one step further. They're using the ratio of the PPT to PPD, that is the trial and dial types of ginsenoside, such as RG1, RE to the RB1 ratio. This is particularly useful trying to differentiate uh, American ginseng from Asian ginseng because the ratio are distinctly different. Now, uh, I, I would say in general, manufacturers do shy away from the use of marker compound, uh, even for one of the better known natural health products that, that uh, derive from ginseng, such as CoFX, is, is the one that have a therapeutic claim that is one of the highest level supported by clinical trial. The only thing they would appear on the label is this extract uh, enriched in polyferential saccharide. There's no quantitative, quantitative measurement of the so-called bioactive. So I would come back later to talk about these challenges dealing with uh, these types of product that are based on polysaccharide, okay? Now, when you look at the look at some of the advancement in the research and development, you can see for the ginseng literature, literature, there are a huge number of publications. And right now there must be about 80 different ginsenocytes. This is one of the major uh, class of bioactive in ginseng. And they keep on coming up with new minor uh, ginsenocytes that are found in the root. And recently I reviewed a article that just dealing with these minor ginsenoside and indeed they are uh, contain very high, a high sophisticated uh, pharmacological activity. Now move on to the, the, some of the other approaches as mentioned by Dr. Uh, Professor Bao about metabolomic analysis. So we did some of these analysis uh, using LC-MS-MS approach, looking at the uh, ginseng, uh, North American ginseng that are grown in Ontario or Canada as compared to grow in China. Because in the marketplace, those that are grown in Ontario worth a lot more money. And obviously the Ontario ginseng grower are more are interested to find a way to differentiate the, between the two. Now, interestingly, when you look at the major ginsenoside profile or the fingerprint, they all look the same, whether it is grown in China or in, in Ontario. You cannot distinguish between them. And when we look at the extract in our study using uh, from five region in China and five different farms in Ontario. When you look at the data, 
after the principal component analysis, we can actually see that the, the material derived from China and in Ontario, they could be segregated. This is due to the presence of some unique molecule that are found in Canadian as compared to the Chinese-grown uh, American ginseng. So it is interesting when they visit China uh, at Guangzhou, about a, a big manufacturing company, they mentioned to me that there are custom synthesis required by the customer demanding that the American ginseng has to come from Canada. So they go to purchase these products and make the extract and they make the comparison with based on the fingerprint. They couldn't find a difference between them. So this tell you about uh, what actually reflects quality. So in our case, we can have a test that we can distinguish between those that are growing in China as compared to grow in Canada, but the general fingerprint that you use for the basic differentiation cannot tell the difference. So it raises the question is, uh, these marker compounds, do they actually reflect the differences in quality or there's only a way to differentiate product from different uh, region or geographical location. So now I want to just to emphasize a little bit about some of the uh, mentioned about the development of new technology, but you can really find the application in the actual practice in the regulation as some of the, uh, the speaker in the panel who are with the ISO TC249 um, project notice that a lot of the uh, highly sophisticated methodology are usually not accepted by the standard uh, organization because the manufacturer cannot afford such a, a state-of-the-art technology. Okay, so this is, there seems to be a bottleneck between the research into very sophisticated new methodology and its application in the field. So now I just want to touch on the final aspect um, about my presentation. This is something to do with the frustration I'm having when I'm dealing with ginseng. As you uh, aware that the polysaccharide component is one of the other major component in ginseng in addition to the ginseno side. This is mostly responsible for the immune health, which is highly relevant in the COVID-19 uh, situation because a lot of customers are looking for an uh, immune booster. So, first of all, polysaccharide are uh, actually exist in many traditional Chinese medicine, and they may actually contribute to a lot of health benefit without us realizing it. So I want to emphasize that polysaccharides are not secondary metabolite as most of the chemical, phytochemical that we deal with in traditional Chinese medicine. So basically these are derived from the cell wall of most of the plant material following the uh, release, following the, the preparation of the decoction or the extract. So for example, in ginseng, the polysaccharide basically is a polymer of uh, a monosaccharide. So these are the major monosaccharide that you can find in ginseng, arabinose, galacto, but Professor Louis, Professor Louis, I think we're running out of time. I think. Oh, we need okay. To speed Just let me finishing off. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so basically, this is a lot of uh, uh, poorly understood material that we are dealing with in our product. So just to give you an idea, to finishing off, most of the tests require say hydrolyzing the product and measure the monosaccharide, okay? And I can tell you that that is not a very good useful uh, approaches because there are so many different types of 
polysaccharide in them, and not all of them are bioactive. Okay. So anyway, so one other thing is I want to, in the final point, is that the polysaccharide, the action is so poorly understood and make it very difficult to standardize or to find out what is the active ingredient. And also, there's also interaction between the gene sinocyte and the polysaccharide. So when you look at just one of these material in the product, it's almost impossible to look at the quality and safety of these material. Anyway, so we're looking for some solution to address this issue, and uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, Sorry thank you so much long. for your thoughts, Professor Lee. It's all good. Talking about the quality and safety of TCM from a Canadian perspective, um, Thomas, over to you now in Hamburg. Okay, thank you, Michael. It's my pleasure to share with you some thoughts about the quality and safety of Chinese medicine. I will focus my talk on Europe and tell you a little bit about some problems we face and give you some ideas how to solve those problems. In my talk, I will have like different topics. One topic is decoction pieces, then we go to herbal extract, then we go to finished products. And I will raise some problems with all those uh, different types. So starting with the decoction piece, we have the large problem in Europe that our doctors, pharmacists and patients, they are not very well educated like um, the doctors and pharmacists in China about the quality of uh, traditional Chinese medicine decoction pieces. So uh, they are not aware what is a really high quality decoction piece and what is a low quality decoction piece. And so they really don't know uh, what they will buy and what they will give uh, the patients. And this will also increase with respect to COVID-19 because in China, decoction pieces are used very much during uh, the COVID-19. So um, the available amount of high quality decoction pieces, they got reduced. So in the next months, we will see a tremendous increase maybe in price in Europe. But I think that a lot of the companies which import the decoction pieces, they will try to keep the price at the same level and reduce the quality. But what can we do to check if we really purchasing high quality? We have heard already that we have to check our decoction pieces according to the regulations of the European. And if we don't have any um, monograph in the European pharmacopedia, we need the Chinese pharmacopedia. So uh, we check the identity, we check some um, contaminants like pesticides, heavy metal, microbiology, and at the end, um, the um, company gets a certificate for analysis you see here on the uh, right side, which tells that the decoction piece fulfill all the requirements. But those requirements are not sufficient to say this is a high quality decoction piece because it says it only fulfills the minimum requirement of safety and quality. So actually, if you have a company which refers on quality, those uh, tests don't give you the chance to advertise that you have the best quality. And everybody will say, we have the best quality. So what can you do if you don't have the experience? So the solution would be, we need a grading system, which tells which decoction piece has which quality. So the decoction piece has uh, the quality control, and then we have a grading from past, so low quality, medium, and high quality. And also uh, for the test, what we have in the pharmacopoeia right now, we have like uh, focusing on one marker compound. And uh, to have like those grading system, we need to uh, improve those testing systems, maybe putting in more markers and also include uh, marker analysis with the fingerprint analysis. And to help to get such kind of grading system, I think we need the global approach and we need the ISO standardization to have all the experts from the world together to find a consensus how we want to control 
the uh, quality and uh, to have a system which is first affordable for the industry and it's not too expensive to use, but at the second time gives us the chance to have different gradings. The next is I want to talk about plant extracts. You know, um, Chinese uh, companies, they produce plant extracts for production of finished products, but also granulars and compactates. But those kind of types of products are seen as raw materials in often cases in Europe. So uh, with raw materials, we have to face, they don't belong to uh, the medical sector. So we don't have good regulation for ensuring the safety and quality of them. And also uh, in the European Pharmacopedia, we don't have a quality control method for granulars, for instance. And um, therefore, if the regulations are so low for such kind of products and they are seen as raw material, also the companies which sell it on the European market, they are not forced to show that the product was produced according to the European GMP standards. So this gives also a high input for a reduced quality because only the uh, good manufacturing practice standards will ensure that the production is safe and has a high result. And uh, also those um, extracts, they are not well, uh, really good absorbed by the um, health authorities. So we have a lot of problems with this um, product. And the solution would be that we define single herbal or multi-herbal extracts as active principles. And for active principles, we have in the uh, European Medicine Agency some regulations, how they can be used and can be used in finished products. And also uh, the European Medicine Agency has already some uh, kind of grading system for those um, extracts which are seen as active principle. So there are some standardized herbal extracts, qualified herbal extracts, and other herbal extracts. And also, uh, I think that to solve the problems with these extracts, we also need high quality ISO standards. At the moment in ISO, we are working on the quality standards for ensuring the quality of granulars. Then we have a framework standard for the quality and safety of natural materials and manufactured products. And I would suggest that we, in the next row, have a new standard for extracts as starting material for the production of medicine. And I will give you an example uh, that this is uh, possible to have extracts seen as uh, active substance. Our company, Confirmate Pharmaceutical, it's a joint venture company between Anhui Turen Pharmaceutical, it's a company based in Anhui province, and the Confirmate uh, company, which is located on the University Medical Center hamburg eppendorf We are the first company in Europe which sells TCM herbal extracts as active principles. And we got the confirmation from our health authority. And with this, we just entered with those extracts the pharmaceutical law and have a way better uh, safety and quality what we can pro uh, provide to our customers. The next topic is the finished products. And there we have the large problem that the finished products, which are, for instance, available in China, which are very good, which could help us a lot in Europe, they are not available because they need to be registered. Registration is very hard. And so uh, they are not here. And we see one problem arises from them also during COVID-19. Patient here, oh, in China, they are very good uh, herbal medicines, which could help you for COVID-19. So they start searching for this, going on the internet, and they find some product in the gray market. They buy it. But with the products from the gray market, we don't have any assurance for the quality and safety. So it's a high risk for our patients if they buy those products on the gray market. And uh, also, we have for the registration the problem that we don't have any standards for establishing the quality control. And the health authorities in Europe, they uh, see it very critically if you want to apply for a um, product with maybe here, Shafang to do capsules, which a, a terps, because it's very hard to control the quality 
and uh, safety of those uh, extracts for a long time. So what can we do to bring products on the market? First, in my uh, point of view, I think we need international standards for quality control and stability testing. Then we have to define at least one marker compound of each herb, which can be clearly identified in uh, the whole product. And um, we should only allow active principles to use to um, make those products. So no raw material, we should use plant extracts, which are defined as active principle and give us more safety. And I think we should start a pilot project for the registration of TCM products on the European market. For example, uh, Shifang Chidu is a very good working traditional Chinese patent medicine on the Chinese market used for influenza and flu. And also we have now some uh, basic pilot um, research information that uh, this product could also be used for treating COVID-19. And we want to go further on with this research. So uh, it would be really nice to have a pilot project to get such kind of complex mixture on the market. And um, another point I want to point out is um, the data, what do we have? We have so many data available in the whole world of the TCM about safety, efficiency, and the quality. But a lot of all those data are very difficult to access from around the world because one thing is the most publications are in Chinese or in other Asian languages, so we cannot read it. And you have so many researches about uh, the constituents, uh, the safety, quality, but it's not available to European or other English speaking researchers. And my idea is that we should join our forces and bring up a global open source database where we collect all the information from uh, the TCM with respect to safety, uh, efficiency, and also the quality. So uh, that we have some information of raw materials like uh, where it's cultivated, which companies are trading those from the cocktail pieces and also from uh, further processing um, companies and to collect all those informations in a traceability system so that the customer or the doctors around the world, if they have a product, they can get the information. Where was grown, which company uh, processed it, which company produced the product, what I'm having in my hand, and gives more trust by this traceability. And if there is a problem with the uh, product, we can use this traceability information to find where uh, the problem was. And also we could include in this um, global database some um, database information for pharmacological information like toxicity, dosage, uh, safety of this uh, kind of herbs or formulations. And also we need a scientific uh, TCM part where like all the research what's done in uh, Chinese gets summarized and also brought to the uh, global TCM scientific community because there is such high treasure in the research what's written in Chinese that we really need to share this with the world. So I think we should start to work together more closely on these topics and we are ready for international pilot pro uh, project and bring the database on the market. So. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much for that, Thomas. Again, talking about some of the challenges for safety and quality of TCM in Europe. And it just always seems to get back to this issue of proper usage of TCM products, as well as differences in standards or simply no standards at all for TCM uh, ingredients and products in Europe um, and offering some fantastic solutions as well, such as that global open source database for TCM, I think is highly fascinating. So. Thanks for that, uh, Thomas. And finally, over to you, Professor Han. Thank you, Michael. Hi, everyone. And uh, today's topic is quality and safety. 
And uh, there's a, a group of chemicals. They are edible, uh, definitely safe, and uh, they have uh, significant uh, diverse bioactivities, uh, but they never uh, be the focus of the quality control. And I'm glad to see uh, today, uh, Professor Liu mentioned the problem. Uh, the name is polysaccharide. And uh, my, topic, uh, my talk is uh, uh, the quality analysis of polysaccharide of Chinese medicine. I will go through these three parts. How important are polysaccharides in Chinese medicine? I will take the uh, very famous formula, Huang Qin Tang, PHY, 906 as an example. And the research team, the R&D team, did a very interesting uh, investigation to study the individual contribution of the herbal component. And they found the whole formula will become useless without jujube. In terms of the golden index of cancer therapy, the prevention of mortality. Jujube is rich in polysaccharides. The content is up to 90%. So in other words, we can say polysaccharides plays the crucial role in the mortality prevention activity in the uh, very famous uh, PHY 906. But the polysaccharide is seldom be the uh, focus of the quality control. And even in the research fields of polysaccharide, and uh, a literature research indicated a very interesting phenomena that few people stated that they got the same polysaccharide reported by others, and even or even by themselves. That's unbelievable in the small molecular research, right? What's the reason? I think we can find the answer in the methodology. The poor repeatability of the methodology is used uh, maybe the answer. And I, here there's a long list of the methods they used to demonstrate the chemical structure of one polysaccharide. And I will take one of them as an example, the methylation. In order to uh, guarantee the methylation is complete, uh, normally we will repeat the operation three or even eight times. And each time, uh, will maybe contain three steps. And each step may have uh, acceptable variation at uh, 5%. Then what's the final variation? It's, the answer is uh, up to the, uh, more than 40%. That's big enough to make a different uh, conclusion regarding the chemical structure. So we need a method to show the specificity of the polysaccharide and the, the results should be highly repeatable. So we try to uh, try to make uh, in two uh, approaches. One is the polysaccharide, another one is the oligosaccharide derived from the polysaccharide. I will take the uh, dental beam office nail as an example, here picture in Chinese. Okay, this, because this one is rich in polysaccharide and the polysaccharide contains is more than 90% in the water decoction. And it's very expensive. There are many adulterants in the market, but it's easy for us to differentiate them according to their fresh flowers and leaves. But once these stamps is dried and tinkled into the small particle, Okay, the authentication will become a, a task impossible, like this. So, the Chinese pharmacopoeia method also addressed the polysaccharide, but the method focuses on the small molecules, the monosaccharide profile. They hydrolyze the polymers into monomers, and we can find the monomer profile are common among the different species. So this method doesn't work anymore. And then we checked the polysaccharide part and we found uh, polysaccharide markers. When we see the molecular size distribution patterns of these uh, different species, this marker could easily differentiate the 
authentic samples from other species. So it's quickly patterned in the US. And we also find this marker, this polysaccharide uh, is indigestible and unabsorbable. But finally degraded by the gut microbiota in the largest intestine. And in turn, modulated the uh, composition of the gut microbiota and showed the anti fatigue effects and the, the uh, tumor suppression effects. By contrast, uh, the small molecules in the uh, uh, Dazobi of Snell doesn't uh, uh, show any uh, bioactivities. So when we, that's the, uh, what we have to do is uh, polysaccharide markers. When we identify the chemical structure, we tried over another approach, the oligosaccharide. We hydrolyze the oligosaccharide into polysac uh, 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 the polysaccharide into oligomers, and we, uh, we wish we can easily analyze, analyze them. But there are still two difficulties. The saccharides are uh, undetectable under UV, and they are hard to separate due to their high polarity. So we modified the chemical structure by adding a fluorescence uh, flag to transform them into the glycosides and uh, make them detectable on the UV. So we can uh, as isolate the monomers, dimer, trimer, and uh, choose the uh, decamers. So finally, we modified the chemical structure of the backbone of the polysaccharide because there's no any glucose in the backbone. And the Oligomer markers could be used to analyze the product's uh, uh, quality, qualitative and quantitative. So this uh, uh, technology is uh, bring us several patents and a stand-up company to uh, provide a commercial uh, service to the industry. And now uh, the lab have moved to the Hong Kong Science Park. In the Past two years, uh, we uh, held uh, the two annual summits of the quality control of valuable Chinese medicines. But this year, due to the COVID-19, and uh, it paused. But uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity, and uh, maybe the uh, cloud meeting is a solution to the, we, we, we can use this new mode to uh, held over uh, QC Sabine. Thank you. That's all. Okay, thank you so much uh, for that, Professor Han, talking about polysaccharides, how to better analyze them because polysaccharides are one of the more important active ingredients in TCM products. So thank you all, gentlemen, for your thoughts and views in terms of how we can better ensure quality and safety of TCM products. I wanna open it up to questions right now. And first, I wanna give an opportunity for any one of our panelists to respond to another panelist because there are so many good and interesting uh, points right now. So if anyone has another question for another panelist, feel free to raise it right now. Uh, can I ask a question to Professor Han? Yeah. Okay, I'm glad that you are talking about polysaccharide, which is some, some of my frustration dealing with this TCM. So you're developing a marker for polysaccharide, right? So are you, can, you, does it relate to the efficacy or the biological activity of polysaccharide? So that's one of the key issues. And how many spe a molecular polysaccharide species you think that are responsible, for example, in bendrobium uh, products? Uh, as we found, the, the, only the polysaccharides are responsible for the uh, uh, bioactivities in terms of uh, antifatage and the tumor mm. suppression. But in terms of, because we know that polysaccharides are highly heterogeneous, they have a large range of molecular size or weight, so do you know which are the bioactive polysaccharide species that you have in your product? How do you do that? Uh, no, I, uh, to me, I, I don't 
uh, think the, the polysaccharide could be uh, in one species could be further divided because they share the very similar chemical structure mm -hmm. features and the uh, um, mono uh, sugar composition. Uh, and uh, maybe we can find many difference according to the reports. As I mentioned, the reports has uh, errors because it used the uh, poorly repeatable uh, methods. So maybe they yeah. are identical to each other, the, the chemical structure are identical to each other, but uh, the method that we use uh, give us the different uh, conclusion, different but, result. But, but ideally- Pro you Hold want on, to Professor Bao, hold on. Okay. Professor, we hold hold that thought because Professor Bauer he wants to jump in. Uh, Professor Bauer, and let, let's try and keep it not uh, overly technical because we do have uh, lay people listening into our conversation yeah. as well. Uh, uh, just a, also a short question to Professor Hahn about the polysaccharides because they are really a very challenging field also for analysis. And so my question would be, if we consider the polysaccharides as an active principle, uh, what about the three-dimensional structure? We know from proteins that the three-dimensional structure is very important for the activity. And if we destroy the three-dimensional structure, proteins become yeah, ineffective. So what about the three-dimensional structure of polysaccharides? Has it, or can it be considered also as a, a quality aspect? Okay, so that's a good question. But uh, the, I think that the question is uh, too big for the current uh, situation because uh, we, we haven't uh, illustrated the, the, the consistent quality, right? So uh, that's uh, too far uh, for us now. And uh, maybe we, we need to uh, solve the problem in the uh, quality control first and then study the structure and the activity relationship. Mm. Professor Zhou, uh, you wanted to jump in as well. You have to unmute yourself. Professor Zhou, you are on mute right now. You have to um, unmute your microphone. Okay, Michael. I, I, first, I would like to uh, jump in this question. Uh, I, actually, I co collaborated with Professor An uh, for uh, several years ago on um, polysaccharide. So according to our uh, collaborative uh, research, we found that uh, acidic polysaccharide from ginseng uh, is uh, highly uh, effective than neutral or, or other uh, polysaccharides. Uh, and uh, there are some specific uh, fractions that is uh, effective than other fractions. So this is uh, the result we have just got. Uh, ho however, I agree with uh, Bauer that the 3D structure uh, is very important for uh, polysaccharide. I, but uh, I think uh, polysaccharide is a very challenging uh, uh, research topic. Uh, when, uh, uh, that's my, I want to say uh, uh, something about polysaccharide. So uh, actually I have a, a question for Thomas. Um, so you mentioned that you are going to, uh, you are constructing a database. I think that, uh, that is a very good idea because there are so many uh, literature written in Chinese, Korean, and the Japanese language on TCM and the Campbell Medicine and Oriental Medicines. And I, I think we should make use of this uh, um, valuable information to the whole world. So, I, but uh, I think this is the big project. Uh, I, I wonder how you can manage this uh, big project. How can we help you to make this happen? So uh, this project was an uh, idea for me now. So for uh, this panel and also for further discussion. So we didn't start with this, but uh, we are in preparation and getting the ideas and getting the framework. But you're right. In order to bring uh, this huge project on the road, we need to join in teams from different parts of the world to make it a really useful tool. So. Uh, all of you and you especially are very welcome to uh, join in and uh, to work together with us to make this happen. So mm. I, I, I have a suggestion for this. I, I think we can invite the National Library of China and uh, maybe also uh, Alibaba uh, for the uh, artificial intelligence to do the, this uh, maybe automatic translation from Chinese, Korean, and Japanese to uh, English or uh, German languages. 
That's my suggestion. Yeah. I think it's really exciting that we have a deal sort of coming in place on our online panel discussion. Professor Bauer, you, you had your hand up as well. Uh, just a comment, uh, what has been discussed. Um, I remember that I think in the 1980s, there was a late professor at Hong Kong Chinese U. I think it was Professor Chang. I, I don't remember the name, but he had a collaboration with IBM at that time. And the goal was really to compile all the Chinese literature about Chinese medicine into a database. So this has uh, started already very early. Unfortunately, I think uh, it was not finally followed or completed and continued. So maybe our colleagues in Hong Kong know a little bit more, but I think it's a good initiative to, to compile the, the knowledge, uh, which is just hidden at the moment. But I would like to maybe also address one question to uh, Dr. Friedemann. Is this okay? Um, yeah, I have one question because uh, you mentioned that uh, the pharmacopoeia monographs are not sufficient to define uh, the high quality. And I agree that the pharmacopoeia monographs only define a, a minimum quality, which is uh, basic, I would say. But <coughs> on the other side, the question is, uh, how, how do you define high quality? Because this is the essential point, and how can you define high quality? Yes, and I think uh, that's that's a really good point because like um, the quality always depends which uh, you pick out. If you want to pick out a marker, then you need to know uh, for which this marker is. So you need to know uh, if it's uh, active ingredients and then if it's active ingredients, maybe it's just active ingredients for one kind of indication, but the herb is used for different indications and other markers would be useful for other indications. So therefore, I think, um, in my point of view, we really need um, discussion and um, joint working group, for instance, in the ISO, with experts around the world to gather all the opinions on this topic and to find a good solution. Because I think another problem is that we always have to keep in mind that the quality control must be done by companies. And you just... Um, showed us a very sophisticated technique, what can be used in the future to control the quality. But I think uh, this kind of technique will um, have a major impact on the price because it's very expensive. And I think uh, so many companies will not be able to um, afford this kind of technique. So we always should uh, look for a compromise of very sophisticated quality control and the price what we have to pay in industry for it. And um, in ISO, I hope that we can start with such kind of standard and that experts from around the world join in to have a really in-depth discussion about this topic. Yes, but because mm. I, I think high quality needs to be defined in a combination of a clinical effect. As I have mentioned, the definition of quality is to be fit for purpose, which means the material must be effective. And of course, the best, the most effective material is the material with the highest quality. So I think quality, a definition of quality without the clinical effect is not possible. So we have to bring the clinical effect and the analytical markers together. Yes. Otherwise, uh, it will always be only half of the picture. Yes. Hmm. Uh, hey, just real quick. We we, we have a question, guys, from an online uh, viewer. Um, Twin Lee asks, how do we predict the potential risk of drug-herb uh, drug interactions involving Chinese herbal medicine? And how do we better monitor the potential adverse reactions or toxicity of Chinese herbal medicine? Uh, I guess the question here, because, you know, drugs, synthetic drugs and Chinese herbal medicine, uh, perhaps maybe two different systems, especially uh, in the elderly who may have multiple diseases, multiple conditions, they might need to take several drugs. And then if we combine the herbal element of TCM in it, um, how do we sort of monitor the risks of that? Uh, anyone, feel free to jump in on that. Can I just start with, uh, the, in Canada, they do the government do have a reporting uh, mechanism for healthcare provider or anyone to report the incident of adverse interaction between herbs and drugs. But then 
most of the cases I remember from the literature is the interaction are based on theoretical basis. There's no actual data to support that indeed the interaction have occurred. And most of them are a possibility of occurrence. In fact, we don't really know the frequency or the potential for interaction. That's a real challenge to start out with first, so. Mm. Professor Zhou, would you like to add on that in terms of what do we know uh, about herb drug interactions? Um, I guess just from a personal standpoint, for example, if I take a TCM product, can I uh, take Western medicine at the same time? Can I, for example, take an Advil along with my TCM product or a Tylenol or what, whatever? Okay, Michael, uh, this is a very interesting uh, uh, question and a very important questions. Uh, in TCM systems, um, I would like to respond to this question uh, at two points. The point one is that uh, in TCM uh, practice, the TCM practitioners always uh, ask the patients uh, whether they are taking uh, Western medicines uh, together. Um, if they got the information, uh, positive re reactions, the TCM practitioners uh, always ask the patients to separate uh, the Western medicine and the Chinese medicine when they take them. For example, uh, take a Western medicine first and uh, one, maybe half or one hour later, uh, take Chinese medicine to reduce the risk to have herbal drug interactions. This is number one. Uh, number two, uh, there is um, uh, herb uh, drug interactions um, uh, because uh, they, they, some Chinese medicines can induce the pharmacokinetic behavior change of Western medicines, then increase, maybe increase the absorption of some Western medicines. Uh, so that will cause uh, some risks. So there is a um, uh, potential risk when you take uh, Chinese medicines and uh, uh, Western medicines together. So uh, we need to avoid uh, this from happening. And we need also investigate how this happened. And in future, we can make a good solution to prevent this from happening. Okay, that's my response. Mm -hmm. can, can I also ask in terms of how do we better standardize TCM around the world? Because it's so customized, it's so personalized. For example, someone taking a TCM product in say Hamburg in Northern Germany might be, uh, have completely different needs than someone who takes a TCM product in Graz in Southern Austria. So, I mean, how do we really standardize this? Anyone, feel free to jump in. Okay, may, may I respond first? Uh, talking about <laughs> yeah, yeah. Professor Joe, go. <laughs> because as, uh, talking about standardization, uh, as you may know, that we, we uh, first, uh, in the very, very first beginning, we planned to have three sessions. The last session will be standardization of Chinese medicine, but uh, uh, we don't have time to uh, arrange uh, that session. So I would like to respond. Uh, actually, we are uh, developing this standardization at uh, several levels. Uh, the first level is ISO standards, uh, as I'm, uh, Thomas mentioned. And also there are some organizations such as uh, WOFAS, uh, World, uh, uh, World for the World Federation, for the uh, Chinese medicine societies. They are also developing some uh, standards for the practice of Chinese medicine in the whole world. So I think uh, these organizations are developing some uh, documents of standardization covering um, uh, quality, safety, and also clinical practice. Uh, I think this can be very helpful for the standardization of Chinese medicine. So maybe other professors can input more information. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, Professor Bauer, yeah, take it away. Yeah, I think standardization is really a, a multi-level uh, process and strategy. And um, it means if we are talking about the standardized product, uh, first, I think it's necessary to use, uh, let's say, a uh, Sustain, uh, raw material with sustainable quality. And this, as I mentioned, is or can be almost guaranteed by cultivation. So I think it's important to use cultivated material which has a quite homogeneous quality. The second is you have to standardize the manufacturing process, which means the extraction process must be performed in a very consistent way and finally, of course, the, the processing of the extract to make a tablet must also be standardized in the same way as it is done in Western medicine. So if all these three levels are controlled, then I think it's really possible to uh, 
produce very uh, consistent quality of uh, products. And we have many examples in Europe, also with complex mixtures. We have a herbal mixture in Europe with nine different plants and extracts, and it can be produced in a very consistent quality by using a tough quality control of the raw material, extraction process, and manufacturing process. So it's possible. And I just uh, point out some of the, the issue as we, the, from the, our experience in the TC249 program, uh, every country have their own expectation or their own standard. There's no unifying standard for all the countries. So it's up to the individual country to decide. So there will be a really challenge to, as, to develop something uh, that applied to all. Another challenge, uh, going back to what Tom is suggesting about the database, uh, in terms of how do you control the quality of the data? Right now we have peer review for the publication of scientific uh, uh, research. Uh, so the data you have from one country or one investigator may not be up to the standard so you may be misleading getting some data that is misleading. So how do you control that? I think there's one thing we need to develop as a mechanism, how to standardize the quality of the scientific data, more so important than the product itself. <laughs> yeah, more standardization, more definitions. Uh, hold on, Th Thomas, how about you respond to Professor Louis first and then Professor Bauer will get to you. Okay, um, for the standardization and to see uh, the quality of the data, we have already for like uh, Cochrane reviews and other review process, we have scoring systems of different publications. So you can rank them actually to uh, the quality of the publication. Sure, we have to improve this, maybe adjust them a little bit more to our um, Chinese publications, but uh, they are already very well uh, evaluated. Uh, evaluation tools for publications. What you can use if you write a review or uh, make a um, meta analysis of data. So uh, we can start from this point and develop this further. And um, concerning your question for the uh, standardization of um, the quality and uh, safety of the TCM for like uh, the global trade, I think uh, the biggest uh, problem is that like all the countries have different regulations and they are so um so inhomogeneously that we really should first uh, find a minimum compromise and then build up on this minimum compromise and refine it so that we get all the uh, different countries um in one boat and develop this together. And that not that one country just goes one direction, another country goes another direction. And then at the end, uh, all the uh, quality standards are not comparable around the world. And if you purchase uh, some product from uh, China, uh, the quality will be completely different if I purchase this one from Japan. And we should reach a level where we all be happy with the quality. Mm. Professor Bauer, you want to add uh, to that? Just to, to mention quickly, the, the issue which uh, <clears throat> Ed Louis addressed, uh, and I completely agree that the, the quality of the published papers is definitely an issue. And we have just uh, seen the, the, the problem with Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine regarding this studies on 7-hydroxychloroquine, uh, which now have been withdrawn <laughs> even. Uh, so it, sh it shows that even in high-ranked journals, you can find fake uh, science. This is always a problem. And therefore, I think uh, it's definitely a challenge to, to uh, evaluate the scientific data. And of course, if you collect all the data, then uh, you will always have a mixture of good and bad science. And it, it's definitely not easy to have a, a final conclusion. And at the end, uh, everyone has to draw its own conclusions. And therefore, I'm also not so convinced whether standardization in a, in a final way is the solution. Because I, I believe that diversity is also very important in life and in, in the global development. If we would not be diverse, we would have a big problem in the future in evolution. Therefore, uh, I think uh, we should even allow 
some different qualities which may have different uh, activities. So I think uh, standardizing everything may be not the solution. <laughs> Mm, that's a very interesting point. Uh, Professor Joe, would you like to respond to that in terms of maybe too much standardization is not a good thing? Maybe have some more diversity in terms of different standards. Uh, uh, yes, I agree with uh, uh, Bauer's uh, opinion that uh, we need to consider both standardization and uh, di diversity. So um, I would like to uh, give an example when we standardize uh, the Chinese medicine, we also consider the diversity. So um, we uh, panels have di discussed the uh, consensus uh, to reach uh, uh, in ISO uh, TC24 line. So actually, sometimes it's very difficult to uh, reach consensus uh, on some specific points. So in uh, some specific uh, standards, we have uh, agreed that uh, uh, in uh, ISO TC2 following members, we can make uh, a way to solve these uh, problems. That is, remain some diversities. Uh, for example, for maybe for, for a micro compounds, uh, uh, we need to quantify the micro compound, uh, but we didn't uh, uh, require the uh, level of uh, this micro compound and I'll just give uh, some examples uh, from a different pharmacopoeia, for example, from European pharmacopoeia, Chinese pharmacopoeia, Japanese pharmacopoeia, on same micro compounds, uh, and uh, illustrate how they require this micro compound uh, to give a reference to uh, the consumers, when uh, the future consumers, uh, when they use these standards, they can choose, uh, maybe they can follow the criteria uh, uh, of um, European pharmacopoeia or maybe uh, US pharmacopoeia, which are, uh, for this specific uh, um, indicators, we just specify the method they, they should use. So this is one way we would like to remain some uh, diversity in a standardized uh, document. That's my response. Thank you. Hmm. Hey, Michael, it, it can I like just one, bring up one, one yeah. point, one challenge? Yeah. It's not the, the dealing with the inter internalization of the standard is how do we convince the skeptics from the biomedical, the Western medicine regarding the quality issue of traditional Chinese medicine? Because right now, particularly in the world, in, in, in the current situation with COVID-19, the world is basically dominated by Western medicine or biomedical sciences. I don't see any leadership in TCM that come out and say, okay, we, we have something to offer. And there's something, I think one of the key issue is relating to the quality and safety of the Chinese medicine. So the first thing is what mechanism do we have or some good leadership that allow us to to, 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 to get rid of the myth and get the real message to the world. Professor Han, could you touch upon um, Professor Liu's point in terms of, uh, are you seeing leadership from China, I guess, in terms of making TCM more globalized? What has uh, Chinese policymakers done on that front and what more needs to be done? Okay, uh, in my opinion, uh, I think is the, uh, now people always say the consistent uh, quality control, but uh, I think the, this is a little earlier to address the, the quality uh, inconsistency before we have a full understanding of the uh, quality markers. Uh, I mean, the, the chemicals responsible for the traditional use. For example, the, uh, that is uh, astragali. Huang Qi, okay, it's very famous and popularly used in Qi as a Qi tonic. Now the chemical marker is uh, the saponins. And there's very few reports regarding the immune, immunomodulating effects of these saponins. But they use it as a marker. According to the marker, maybe the products should a very high consistent quality but it has nothing to do with the traditional use, right? So uh, I think, uh, okay, we need to, uh, at the same time, we uh, uh, control the quality, uh, the consistency, 
And then we need to pay more attention to the uh, chemicals regarding, uh, related to the traditional use. So I, I think mm. we, we, we need to pay more attention to the uh, therapeutic effects or the uh, Chinese uh, use recorded in the uh, Chinese medicine uh, classic. Anyway, they are uh, they comes from the uh, clinical use in the past uh, past uh, thousand years, right? That's a, a should gain our full respect. Um, I want to talk about uh, TCM leadership um, in just a second again, but I want to just follow up with you, Professor Han, because um, one of our users asking uh, again in terms of quality control markers, uh, Chun Li our online viewer says, it may be relatively easier to choose a quality marker for a single herb, but how do we actually choose proper quality markers for very complex formulas? Okay. Mm, now that's a big difference between the uh, quality marker for single herb for the raw materials and the quality marker for the final finished products. That's quite different because for a single herb, the task for the marker is to uh, authentication, authenticate the samples, right? Uh, the true or fake. But for a uh, finished product, the marker should be used to not only guarantee the authentication, but also to guarantee the uh, quality, good or bad. So we still we need to pay more attention to the uh, quality marker regarding uh, related to the traditional use, related to, to the uh, traditional function of this uh, uh, herbs. Mm. That's quite different. Professor Bauer, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can I you also just that? answer that question? And uh, I think it's easy to answer if I show you again my, my presentation, because it was addressing exactly that question. Uh, Wang Ji Jian Song Tang is also a, a Fu Fang formula which is consisting, I think, of five different herbs. And the different colors here in the chromatogram show the constituents of the different herbs, which means uh, even in a mixture of herbs, it's possible to define specific markers for every herb. So it's, it's nowadays using these techniques, it's possible really to uh, characterize even complex mixtures. Mm. Okay, so hopefully, uh, Chun Li, if you're watching Professor Han and Professor Bauer, I have answered your question. Um, I wanna get back real quick to TCM leadership again and ask you the same question, Professor Joe, in terms of what are you seeing from the Chinese government in providing more guidance and more direction uh, for TCM to be adopted more globally and, and removing some of this mysticism perhaps around TCM? Okay, uh, Michael, I would like to respond that uh, um, during the COVID-19, epidemic, uh, Chinese government uh, indeed uh, initiate uh, the, uh, indeed uh, leader the uh, TCM in not only in China, but also uh, worldwide. Um, you may know that there is an organization uh, called the uh, World Federation uh, of um, Chinese Medicine Societies. They are providing uh, guidance of uh, TCM on how to uh, deal with uh, COVID-19 patients. And uh, this information are uh, come from uh, Chinese government and also from uh, Chinese uh, uh, TCM uh, doctors. I think uh, uh, Chinese medicine, uh, uh, the central government and the uh, uh, organizations have provided uh, uh, a lot of information and guidance uh, to the TCM doctor uh, in China and around the world. And uh, also Chinese government and uh, some company has uh, provided uh, some um, uh, solutions uh, to the world, such as some uh, medications, Lianhua Qingwen uh, capsules and other medications has been uh, provided by, uh, by some uh, companies. I think uh, uh, that medications has been uh, proved in clinic uh, is effective to treat some uh, mild uh, COVID-19 patients. And, uh, uh, it has uh, been used in China, and I hope this uh, kind of medications can be used by other countries' patients and uh, uh, contribute to their good health. That's my answer. Thank you, Michael. Mm. Okay. So in terms of next steps 
next steps, the immediate next steps for improving the safety and efficacy, the quality of TCM products. What should the immediate next steps um, do you think uh, should be, Thomas? Let's let's go to you for this one. So uh, for the next steps, I think uh, like uh, this kind of grading system for uh, the raw herbs or the cocktail pieces is very important. And together uh, we need to define better quality control markers for uh, such kind of uh, further developed products like extracts and finished products so that we can make them safe and can ensure at the same time the high quality. So I think uh, a major part of this kind of work will be done uh, by the ISO, but also it should be done by uh, different uh, organizations which write the pharmacopoeia. So also Professor Bauer uh, will have a major part in uh, getting new standards for more um, herbs inside the European pharmacopoeia. And then we just have to bridge the standards in the pharmacopoeia with the ISO standards. Okay. Uh, and Professor Bauer, what would you like to see as the, the immediate next steps, I guess, from a European perspective? I think uh, we have really to start with uh, the raw material and uh, with the production of the raw material, which should be done in a sustainable way, really to have also enough material to supply the world. So I think we should really um, put a lot of focus on cultivation of the material. And cultivation will also immediately... Uh, produce quite a consistent quality, which means cultivation can really solve a lot of problems. And therefore, this should be uh, encouraged in a way. And uh, then we just, we just follow also the, the existing quality guidelines. I think um, if we are really applying them and using them, then uh, we are on a quite safe way. Okay. Any final remarks, gentlemen, before we wrap it up? Uh, maybe I can just sort of uh, re-express my frustration in that yeah. there's a lot of research going on in terms of quality, safety, and efficacy. And But how do we find a way to translate that into the regulatory framework and also convince the industry that is the way to go? Because... When you move on to new technology, it costs money, right? And it will go increase the prices and whether the consumer are willing to pay for that. So this is a, a, a global, <laughs> a holistic issue that we have to deal with. It's not that simple. Yeah, well, certainly a lot more challenges ahead in terms of um, uh, integrating TCM more with modern medicine. I mean, after all, this is a medical system that spans over 2000 years. So Still a lot of work needs to be done in terms of standards, quality, efficacy, safety, and just making sure the language between TCM and modern medicine, I guess, uh, is a bit more standardized. The, the gap can be bridged a little bit better. Okay, so we're gonna have to leave it there. We're gonna have to wrap it up. Thank you so much to each of our panelists, Professors Zhou Hua, Edmund Bui, uh, Rudolf Bauer, uh, Han Chuan Bin, and Dr. Thomas Friedemann for sharing your research, your thoughts and findings on traditional Chinese medicine. And of course, thank you to our online audience, wherever you may be, for spending your time with us today. And as always, Xi Jinping Think Tank, Think Tank will continue to partner with other institutions to bring you more in-depth perspectives to help you better understand China and the world amid the coronavirus pandemic. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. I'm Michael Wong here in Beijing, and we hope to see you again next time. Bye for now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.